new hoodies for sure. Yeah, I want a new hoodie. But I really <laughs> like the ones we had at Dubai last year. So, oh, that's weird. Hello, Mr. Velman. Hello. Give me one second here. I'm going to switch my Wi-Fi router. All right. Give us a little better connection. The island connection. The island connection. I think there's still like 3G on that island, aren't there? There we go. You figured it out after all these years up there? Well, yeah. It's still hit or miss, but we have two routers in our house, so depending on what side you're on, your device just pings something different. And I was still on the the other one, so I'm parked right next to this one, so it should be no problem. Oh, we hope. We hope. <laughs> yeah, I've been fooled before. Yeah. Well, Is you're it certainly like not Canadian? the only one who's ever had problems with that. Yeah. Is yeah. it Canadian Wi-Fi or American Wi-Fi? Is this? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm pretty close to Canadian the States. I could be stealing sure. it from the from Washington somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. I think it's Canadian Wi-Fi though. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we don't want to get you in trouble. Have the Wi-Fi please come after you or something. But, yeah. Hey, Pat, thanks for joining us. I really, really. No, I can't. It. Nobody comes to the island. <laughs> My pleasure, guys. Yeah, we don't get too many guests on here. Usually, just me and Brian just talking about just boring stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, that's something that we wanted to do was kind of get you know athletes and people in the CrossFit space and just get more engagement, get more. I don't know. I just, I figure we always have a lot of these conversations behind the scenes or at, at, at venues. That's usually the only time we get to really talk, but I don't know, figure give Brian a chance to actually talk to some athletes and ask some questions and vice versa. I mean, there's a lot of athletes there that care what Brian think about, but I don't know. I don't know if you're one of them. But. <laughs> Why not? If we get these stuff, the stuff out in front of everybody, it's more fun that way. Mm -hmm. Well, you're our, you're our first guest, and I actually I just got back from uh, 48 days on the road. I don't know if you have been following along at all or not. I wouldn't say super close, but I have been aware that you've been really far away. I know you've been putting the updates up about – I haven't been reading them all, but I know I've been following that you've been on quite the adventure. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it, was, it, it was cool. I mean, I got to go to a lot of different uh, for countries that I've never been to, but also like be in the communities of different CrossFit uh, environments, especially in Europe. <clears throat> and I know you've done some traveling over there and, you know, certainly competed over there a bit. So you can probably relate somewhat on that regard. But for me, it was neat to go to kind of the off the beaten path areas and see just the like grassroots of CrossFit existing in places like Norway and Sweden and Spain that uh, also exist all over North America. Yeah, I think honestly, one of the biggest shames with the current kind of structure of our season is that it doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of us to go to places like that uh, because the travel is so intense and it's not really relevant for our season or things like that. But it would be great if there was more opportunities to go see places like that, because, I mean, they have their communities there and and some of the Europeans make the rounds around there a little more often. But that community doesn't see and we don't see them like the North American fields and stuff like that are very, you know, we're very isolated on this side of the pond to them. Um, so it would be cool to be able to spend a little more time out there and, uh, and really dive into just what those communities are like and be able to take part in some of the stuff out there. Did you compete in something as well? I think I saw you did a competition, right? It was not the intent of the trip originally, but since I was over there, right. they had the competition was three divisions, RX intermediate scaled. The RX had two days. The other two divisions had one day each. So <clears throat> I asked the organizer if I could compete in one of the divisions. And he said, absolutely. He found me a partner. It was actually his business partner. And we did uh, intermediate men's teams of two. Yes. Sweet. Now that's awesome. How was that? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you can relate to how difficult it is sometimes to maintain fitness or perceived fitness, at least when traveling a lot. So I was a little bit nervous that I was like nowhere near what I would want to be to be actually taking a competition floor. Uh, but I kind of uh, somehow was able to do OK. I feel like I surprised myself when, when it was a you know, three, two, one go and did a little bit better than I expected personally, even though our team still finished towards the bottom third. A competition floor has a way of doing that to you. It pulls it out of you. And I, you know, the, 
I, th I really like the thing that you're talking about because I went on this, like this season, I've been able to shift my focus a little bit from coaching full time to traveling a little bit more. And so I tried to stack some of these stops in Europe. So I knew I was going to be going to Madrid to do the commentary there. And I reached out to some other friends and that's how I was able to go to Sweden and Norway while I was already over there. And it, it got me, you know, and because of the competitions that I was able to, you know, work at and attend there, I also had this kind of community opportunity. And I, th and then I was like paralleling it is, this is going to be a shocker for you, Pat, but I was paralleling it with a disc golf. <laughs> okay. In disc hey, golf, stick to what you know. <laughs> in disc golf, they have a pro tour, which takes place in the United States. And then they have a European pro tour, which takes place in Europe. And they run parallel to each other for like eight or 10 weeks over the course of the summer. The European summers are a lot shorter than uh, the North American summer, at least in the part where they host most of the competitions. And every year there's a couple guys who go either way, a couple of American uh, players that will go and do the European tour or a couple of European players that can find a way to come over here and play. And this past year, the best player in the history of the sport forwent two months of the North American tour to go and hit eight consecutive stops on the European tour. And in addition to doing that integrated with the disc golf community over there. And mm -hmm. you know, that, that doesn't exist yet in the sport across it. So there's not like a European tour that's happening for, you know, however many weeks in a row, and it might not be feasible to compete eight weeks in a row and cross it anyway, but you, you certainly could see a, a place where someone who is you know, fairly prominent in, in North America as an athlete might be able to choose one or two competitions over the course of six weeks and make a couple stops uh, along the way. I think actually HWPO and, and Matt uh, did something like that on the back of Dubai last year, going throughout Europe a little bit. And that is like mm -hmm. a, a possible way to, you know, maybe see some of that integration that um, I do agree with you is missing from Europe to North America. Pat. Yeah, it just right now it doesn't make enough sense because I think it what would be cool is not even having parallel seasons, but if there was, you know, if all the competitions say that currently exist could all get on the same page where there was some sort of like cyclical calendar where there was five, six, seven European stops in a row, and then the next five, six, seven came to North America, it would allow people, if you wanted to, to go to Europe do two, maybe three competitions, then come to North America, do two, three competitions that would benefit the Europeans and the North Americans evenly. And then I don't know, the Australians got to figure it out. <laughs> maybe we can pay, have a stop in there somewhere, but, but you know what I mean? Like just so that there is, it, it's not so much jumping around back and forth. Like I gotta be like Europe, then back in Texas, then I gotta be back in Europe again. Then I gotta go to Canada. Then I gotta go back. And it's just, it's too much travel and it, it's not uh, sustainable right now. But there's a version of a of a tour kind of competition series where you could see something like that because it is unfortunate, right? You look at, you know, how for all of a guy like Matt, his entire career, would he compete in Europe once? And yeah, it was, yeah. it was, and it was during, the san the, during the sanctional era when you could do that. Like, yeah. otherwise, it just didn't, it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense for him. And, and so you have the same thing. You've got some high level Europeans that will never touch ground here unless they make it to the games. And it's just the way it is because it's expensive to get here. And even if you want to go to an event like Wadapalooza or something like that, um, you've got to do a big qualifier. You've got to jump through a bunch of hoops and then you got to get here and be here for however many couple of weeks at least to make it make any kind of sense. And uh, it's tough, right? So uh, it would be cool because it's like we, we love to see the Europeans here because we never see them. And it's I'm sure it's the same thing there. Like there is uh, an aspect of rarity that like if Justin Madera shows up in your town, suddenly you're like, oh, man, like that's awesome. I haven't seen those guys ever. But we, you're, you're, you're somewhat used to seeing the BKGs or Yanakoskis or any Thor's daughters out there. Um, so not that I'm sure they still love them to death, but the novelty is a little bit different, I think. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, the you know, uh, Matt did compete in Dubai one year, but the one you're referring to is strength and depth in London in the yeah. sanctional year. And when he, and I was there that year. And I think I think Rich brought a team there and Haley yes. might have gone as well. And I mean, it was like people went crazy to see them over there because you're well, right. Tia, it's, it's it's possibly a once in a lifetime thing. Tia was there, mm -hmm. but she wasn't competing. Not as exciting. So, and we see, we see some happen, you know, like, like I think actually, like I mentioned Justin and I know he went down to down under championships, I think last year. And I don't think he competed there either, but he was just there. Ellie was going home to visit family and they just went and he, he did a visit and same thing. It's great. You can create really cool activation opportunities for athletes through that. But, um, 
but you know, for him to do that, that's taken a month out of his trip. And were it not for the fact that his, his girlfriend's family is there and things like that. And it's a trip for them. It probably wouldn't make sense. So there's not a lot of other athletes who are going to do that because it's, it's just a really big trip. Right. Well, Pat, but, you, you know, what? maybe one day, right. Those are things that we in blue sky. Maybe one day we can have a, a system where there is a little more of that intermixing and it makes more sense and it's more viable. Yeah, you were – well, Fikowski did something similar, and you were part of the first leg of it when you guys – when he did Elfid and you were there um, kind of just hanging out and you know, doing some activations, and then he left Elfid and went straight to Dubai. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of like pick and choose. So you you kind of kind of seen that, you know, and kind of almost act as, act as an ambassador, especially um, with a region like Egypt and the Middle East or that's not very rarely hit when it comes to CrossFit. I know, like, underdogs, they're doing like, – whole two week activation along with um outfit this coming month or next month mm -hmm. yeah and it's just i think that you need you need events that line up appropriately to make it really work otherwise it's you know and brent had some friends i think who were in dubai somewhere somewhere near there so we spent some time there in the in between so again the travel wasn't going to mess them up pre-competition and uh he could do a little tune-up with outfit right before and and you know service that community and there's cool opportunities, but it's everything takes time, right? And, it's, and it takes energy. And it, when our when our competition season is really all or nothing based around, you know, open quarters, semifinals, games, for every one of those big trips you want to make and steal away from your training, that's an extra two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. You don't get to train for the big show. Um, and, you know, some people are more willing to do more of that than others. And like, I, I'm a guy that competes more than most, um, and I'm happy to do it. Cause that's what I like about the sport. I'm not, I'm not interested in spending an extra five weeks in my garage, but uh, you know, that's all that stuff is a, uh, it's give and take and it all comes with a certain amount of sacrifice or you have to have, you have to understand what you're giving up. I think it's just a choice that you make. Um, but you know, at the end of the, of a lifetime, I think those things like what Brent did and had cool opportunities in Egypt and, and Dubai, like those are awesome. At the end of a career, those are kind of the, the memories you want to collect as well. So. And you are going to make one, uh, <clears throat> at least one international stop this off season, correct? Uh, I am. I'm going to be at that uh, Fit Fest in the UK in Birmingham. In uh, what is that? The seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, or something like that of December, early December. Yeah, it's the same. It's actually I'll do my same, one. It's the same weekend as Dubai, so I'll be, I'm curious to see how, you know, everything works that weekend with a few different marquee events going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how they did the, I mean, they're doing sort of a, an elite competition there, but it's like, there's a one day individual elite event. And then there's a second day of, I think they're making teams and we're doing sort of a, it's, it's a little bit less. I think that there's, you know, it's competition still, but I don't think we're even picking our own teams. So it's a bit more of a, a showcase kind of a, more of an exhibition. But, and I'm not sure how they did the Dubai. I never got an invite even to Dubai. So I'm not sure how they organized that whole competition this year. So I'm not sure who will be there, but I'm sure it'll be good athletes there. Well, I've been, I've been trying to follow along with the fit fest and uh, I keep getting like conflicting information. I, I had also thought it was going to be an individual and then a team, but then I saw something that might just be teams throughout, but either way, it's more of a mm. showcase than a competition is how I understand it. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm. Mean, hey, look, that's how it got sold to me. So I've, I have, uh, I've had the old bait and switch done a few times in my career, where you show up and all of a sudden you're getting your ass kicked a little more than you thought you would. But uh, that's what I thought is that it was a bit more of an exhibition, um, which is cool. I think it's fun. Again, this is an opportunity for some of the North American athletes to get out there and um, and take part in a different community and do something fun. And, uh, and not, I think sometimes the reason why a lot of athletes don't compete as often is there's this concern that anytime you take the floor, um, we're kind of only as good as our last appearance. And anytime you take the floor, it's like your, your whole value is being measured. And so if it's December and you're not really prepping for competition and you show up and, Oh, you know, Dallin beats me in the individual, but I beat him at the games. Like, Oh no, what does that mean? And, and I think people get too caught up in that. Like it's sports. People need to just relax and go show up and take the floor and do something expose yourself to some different environments and different competition formats and things. And try to remember that it's supposed to be a little bit funny at least. Um, but I'm excited for this. My family's coming out for this too. So my wife and kid are going to come out and we're going to spend 
uh, you know, probably 10 days around the London area after this is done uh, and just get a little holiday in before Christmas. A holiday before the holiday. <laughs> oh, I can't. Yeah, I got to take advantage when I can because Christmas holidays never really counts because I'm always doing Wadapalooza that, like immediately afterwards. And I have uh, I've really skimped on my Christmas gluttony in many, many years. So uh, I feel like I'm always. Is that, uh, is that in the cards for you again this year? Going to hit Wadapalooza, make it three off season events? I'll go back. I'll go to Wadapalooza. Yeah. You're like the king of Wadapalooza. So. You are. I mean, screw this. Screw this body. Can. It, it can do it. <laughs> Are you, hey, you, say, you, you, you say screw that body, but I mean, I was yeah. talking with someone about this the other day. You, you know, you, you popped onto the scene in 2016 and it's seven, eight years later and you're more or less in the same spot, still competitive with the best in the world. So you must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah, I don't show my tears. <clears throat> but it <laughs> looked like it's, it doesn't get, it's not getting easier. I've actually thought a lot about how, if I was, everybody's just getting quite good and the margins are getting much smaller. I think like the, if I was as good in 2016, 17, as I am now, it would be awesome. Like I, things would have felt great. Right. I'm just like, I'm a lot fitter in a lot of ways, but I think I'm like, it takes a little more out of me these days that I'm just kind of wishing like, man, why didn't I just try this hard back then? It would have been really nice, but I, you know, who knows? Um, well, you it's, nice. it's nice to, it's nice to know that i can still hang in there though it's definitely a little, i wouldn't say it's not a concern of mine every time i take the floor and i go to you know big competitions like rogue or Wadapalooza, you're like you show up and especially off-season events where you're never really sure where everybody's at and uh, it's a little different than the games when everybody's kind of prepping for the big show but i feel like every time you show up and you're like geez i hope i hope i still got it you're that or I'm about to get left in the dust. And then, you know, you get two events in and it's all the same. You, it feels the same. It's always the same. So uh, you have, you, I, never, I definitely don't have that that confidence coming in every time. But by the time it's day two or three, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, well, last week, last year you did, uh, you did double. You did a single and a team um, with PB and J. Is there, are you planning on doing something similar this year? Or has there been any talks of bringing that team back together? We've talked about it. I, uh, I'm, I'm for sure. I think I'm going to do both individual and team again. Um, you know, there's been some after last year. People were sore after two day, two full divisions of competition, four full days. Mm -hmm. I think it was a little more than some people were had bargained for in off season training mode in terms of volume. But again, I'm a bit. I just like I can't sit still. If I'm going to be there, like I'm, I might as well do both <laughs> of them. Like what? Am, what am I going to go stand in the crowd like? I, I don't know. I could go stand at a booth for like eight hours or I could uh, just be on the competition floor and like, I'll feel just as tired at the end of the day. So um, I might as well stick to what I'm good at. Hey, so standing, I'm, I'm standing, gonna do, I'm standing gonna for eight hours, standing for eight hours can I be know. almost harder on the body. <laughs> I know. I'll take it out of you. So I'm, uh, I'll, I'll be out there and we'll see. I'm not sure yet if the, if PB and J is going to come back or if we're going to, if we're going to take a hiatus this year, but, uh, give, give someone else a chance. Anyway, <laughs> let's see. Maybe I'll just win it with another team. Who knows? Ooh. The, uh, I, that would be the move. And then I could just show Brent yeah. and Jeff that like, I didn't need them. <laughs> they <Yeah>. needed you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But it's always that, that team division is really fun. Like I'm just very, I, I like, I really, I had not done the team division really anywhere, uh, until we did that. And it, it's very, it's very fun. It's very cool to, especially with guys that you you regularly compete against to be able to kind of join forces. And, um, you know, we have a lot more in common than we, we have uh, in differences. Right. So I feel like we're constantly at each other's throats and at arms against each other in individual competition, but it's really fun to take a second to just be like, eh, we're all pretty much the same <laughs> and uh, have a lot of fun with each other uh, in those team divisions. So I thought that, that that sort of uh, event is a lot of fun. And after two stressful days of individual, it's kind of nice to decompress with a couple of days of team. I do think the order individual then team is, is generally considered an, a very nice way to go about it. And I, this mm -hmm. thing that you said about uh, just like feeling the beat down after those four days, I feel like I heard a lot of that after rogue last year, for the people that both at Wadapalooza, even some of the guys that went to Dubai. And I always wonder, you know, if, uh, if the like the organizers or the programmers are listening to that thing and if they'll take any of that into consideration in subsequent years. 
Yeah. So this is again, like I said, I've been fooled before. Uh, we have had, we've given that feedback before, I know in a few different events and had the people say, oh, you know, yeah. Oh, we, we hear, yeah, that we got a little bit out of control this year. I think it's going to be better. And the next year registration rolls around for some off season events and they're like, oh, it won't be anything like last year. You know, we're, it's much better. going to be a lot easier on the body and you show up and it's, it's the same, if not worse. Right. And the sport progresses. Like I can't. And also I think there's part of it where you're kind of like, is it me? Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, you know, another year older. This is hitting a lot harder. And you start looking at everybody else and you're like, no, nah, no, nah, it's not me. That was like, that was hard. And, uh, you know, this last year, I think Rogue was was more than anybody bargained for. Yeah. And you know what? Like, I'm OK with that. Like, it's a it's a massive prize purse. It's a massive offseason event. Um, but it, I, up to that point, it had still kind of always been sold as like, you know, we're, we're playing with new equipment. It's a bit more of a showcase. It's a fun event. It's not really meant to beat you guys up. And everybody keep, kept buying it. And I feel like last year when we started on the Thursday and we did that trail run and then it was three events a day for the next three days, like after the Friday, everyone was like, no, nah, man, like this is like, this is basically the games. <laughs> and, and, but, but nobody had been, pre had been preparing for that level of volume. Right. So by the time like Sunday rolled around, everyone was really beat up. And, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I, I feel it as much or worse than anybody out there, but I'm kind of good at that. I think in my career, my durability has been like, if I have ever had a superpower, that's it. Is that like, and as I get older, I'm like, man, you know what? If I can make it till Saturday, Sunday, and then everybody's feeling sore. Now we're like, this is where I live. Like now we're in the, I'm in the zone. Like I'm always feeling like this. So as soon as the young guys start feeling old, now I'm, I, I can reel them in. So that's why I tend to be a little stronger in those last couple of days of competition is I just, I have a good level of tolerance for that kind of like beat down over the course of four days. And so, I don't know. I, on one hand, I kind of want it to stop. But on the other hand, maybe that'll make me <laughs> less successful overall. So uh, it might be the one thing I have going for me. Well, people talk about it all the time in this sport that, you know, if you want to be one of the best to ever do it, which you certainly are, you know, you have to be able to recover better than everyone else. And that can be, you know, mo you know, minutes like it was at the intervals test at the games this year, or it can be, between events like the, you know, a lot of people struggled coming off the bike, going into the pig chipper and, or it could be day to day and especially over three, four or five days of competition. And it's difficult for competition programmers, I think, because, you know, they don't maybe I don't think they want to kill you guys, but when you're rogue this year out of 20 men competing at the games, 16 of them have, have a, at least one top 10 finish at the CrossFit games to their name. So like you, you also need to create a test that's going to, you know, provide separation and finding that balance, I think, can be tough. It is. And there's an art to it, right? Like, I think there's definitely a difference between creating a test that's got so much intensity or volume that, like, that's what's going to separate people or allowing the race to take shape, right? Like, at the end of the day, the athletes make any race exciting. You can make it as simple or basic as you want. Um, but as long as the goal is obvious from a spectator perspective, it's exciting because the race is what makes it exciting. And that's why whether it's separated by minutes or seconds or milliseconds, people are engaged. So we always joke, like you could drop a nickel in the middle of the field and be, and th 10 people out there and be like, first guy to get it to the end zone gets a hundred points. And like, it would be <laughs> aggressive and amazing and whatever, like it doesn't need to be much. So yeah. there's kind of this illusion that it's like, no, you know, like barbell has to be 225 now and everybody's getting better now it's 275 and now it's 315 it's like like it doesn't really need to be that always there is mm -hmm. totally we need to have some of it but if you're looking at test after test after test that's just like rx plus 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 because we have a bunch of top 10 athletes so we gotta it's like no you don't you really don't uh and i've we've seen it lots in certain events where you're like nah I get this part of the program and this one, this one's a little gratuitous and maybe unnecessary. And like, th there's like little misses here and there, but we learn from it. And I'd say like rogue does it as well as anybody um, in terms of programming a long event. The only miss they had last year, I gave Josh Bridges shit for this was uh, we clean and jerked every day. <laughs> the, last, the, the last event, the evening event. Yeah. The Thursday we didn't, but the oh, you evening still had event, to pick up sandbags and throw them over an object though. Right. Yeah, I know so sound big clean, but yeah, we did uh, in in the bar in the 
bike DT on Friday night. We did clean and jerk there. And then we did log clean and jerk the next night. And then the last event was heavy grace. So I was like, ah, did we really have to clean and jerk three times in three different ways? I don't know, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And every competition or programmer has their own way of going about doing those things. The more that I've spent time, you know, in the, in the kind of build up or behind the scenes for, for programming, whether it's, you know, it doesn't have to be massive events, but I've been involved with that at semifinal level, Wadapalooza, Dubai, and then other you know, competitions like Crucible, Iron Games, stuff like this. Um, when you're intimate to the programming, you you know you lose sight of certain things. You're just too close to it. You spend too much time. I'm sure, yeah. And you can't and you can't like share it so broadly to get enough eyes on it that sometimes it's it becomes obvious to someone else because that's how you get the leaks that you don't want and things like that. But uh, like I said, Rogue does a great job. I mean, they they're it's fun there introducing new elements every year. Like I love seeing some of the hints that they put out. I think they, they put out like a circus dumbbell a little while ago, Katie or somebody put a photo out. And I like the strongman kind of elements that we, we let leak into the CrossFit side for that. It's just a fun, it's a fun event. They do a great job. When so you're, when you're, down, there, when you're anyway. down there, do you ever take a time to go watch the strongman compete? I always do. I love watching the strongman. They're like, <laughs> I and it's, maybe it's just because I'm too close to it, but I think that they're way more fun to watch than the CrossFit is. Um, I think I, it's just, just I think I think I've just watched happened. enough CrossFit in my life, and I look at it and I'm like, ah, yeah, I can do that. But like watching them do that when they did their deadlift on the platform last year, and it was like a 900 pound deadlift, and they were just like repping it out for like guys are doing like 10 reps and it moving fast, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes no sense. They move like a thousand pound yoke, 50 feet in like 12 seconds. You're like, man, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so awesome. Like, it's just awesome. So I, I, I think it's spectacular to watch and a lot of fun. And I know we get to see those guys in the back a lot and they love watching some of the stuff that we do too. And it's sort of a, a really funny powwow in the back sometimes because they'll have screens in the back and, and in the warm up area and the locker room and, um, will come up from an event or they'll come up from an event and everyone's just like freaking out in the locker room about stuff that happened to which, whichever <laughs> division had just gone. And uh, there's a lot of mutual admiration, I think in the rooms. So it's very cool. It's cool to see that across, you know, fitness and strength sports. Um, Cause I know there's a lot of like, I feel like there's a lot of uh, charged hatred between strength, a lot of different weightlifting and strength sports over, over the internet. So it's cool to be in person with elite level performers in those places and see that that's not the case. Everyone's just like psyched wow. for everybody else. Ever, everything is always a lot calmer in person. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you might, but it's you... not, it's not those people, right? It's like, it's not the people doing it at the highest level are not the ones who are going to be like, Oh, bodybuilding stupid or CrossFit stupid or whatever. It's always like some other random guy who knows. But like the people who are actually high performers are like, there's a lot of just respect for what it takes to be a high achiever at anything, I think. And uh, they can see it. So it's very cool. I love watching the strongman. I would say if anybody's going there, don't miss it. No, it's a, it's a absolutely, uh, there's no that question about the strongman. That is a showcase. You're getting to see, I mean, they're competing, but like it, they're on display for sure. Yeah. The whole, like their whole sport kind of is like that though. Like, I feel like sometimes we take the field and it's like, all right, you know, it's going to be 20 minutes. Like I think about something like our, the last workout we did or not the second last one we did last year with the like running the, or the muscle ups, the squats, the goblet squats, it's like seven rounds. It was a long workout and it was a lot of back and forth and kind of, you lose track of who's where it was a lot to take in and, and really like follow. But when it's strongman and the events like one minute every time, like you, you can be locked in and you know exactly what's going on. You know how many reps somebody's done and what the score to beat is. And the way that they let the field progress through the tests is always, you know, the, the people leading are going last and it's only ever one person at a time. Well, sometimes head to head, but it, it's just like, it's really easy to follow. So I feel like some of those are just like, it just, it grabs your attention and it's so easy to watch. So anyway, you might you might get to experience something similar in London as well because they have the England Weightlifting Championships yeah. and they have the British Indoor Rowing Championships. So maybe you'll get yeah. a chance to see some different elite level athletes on some specific disciplines that CrossFit does but doesn't specialize in. Yeah, well, I hope they don't line me up next to them. Like I'm not looking for that. <laughs> I'm like, I, I love uh, 
I have a huge amount of respect for what it takes to be a specialist in a sport. I think it's, it's incredible. It's incredible to see the difference between a specialist in a sport and what we can do. Cause we're like, you know, high school level at most things. Whereas like elite is elite. Like it's properly elite. And the people who are like those people rowing the indoor rowings for their two Ks, it's like, they would smash us. Whoever's the best rower in CrossFit is going to get obliterated by like, a jv rower and it's just it's awesome it's cool to see and i love to see it so i love watching other any kind of sport that's why i love, like a huge fan of uh fitness and sport but i'm excited that's cool i'll, I'll definitely tune into all that stuff between heats i'll go watch it i'll forego my warm-up to go watch it <laughs> i did want to ask you You mentioned like repping out things i wanted to ask you about one other thing that rogue recently did uh, they, I think they might have announced even the winner of this today, Colton Mertens and one other guy and then one woman in this squat a challenge. You know, the Rogue likes to do these little challenges. I think it was body weight, back squats, unbroken sets. And all of these people did like 115 or so reps consecutively yeah. with the body weight, back squat. And if you, you know, <clears throat> forgive me if this is an inaccuracy, but I feel like squatting has been a, a big part of your journey in CrossFit. I think you've talked about before how like you needed to build your squat up over time. And maybe you could help quantify how impressive these numbers are. Well, look at this. The men were 116. The women was only 85. Yeah, the men were much more than the women. Um, what's amazing, though, is that Colton didn't even come top three, but he had the most squats, which means he jumped. He didn't jump very far. So I think – and I don't know how the, – the, the way this test worked was every squat you did added a certain amount of distance to your max jump, I think. So you did your best broad jump and then it added a certain amount of inches based on how many squats you did, I think. So the guys, I mean, a hundred, like I, I'm curious how long that was. Like that's gotta be five minutes of squatting under the bar. Like that's just a long time to hang out under the bar. And like, I, I don't know if they had a time limit, but it's kind of just like, when are you going to get fed up? Like for me to like Colton's doing 185, like I would have been doing, you know, 200 pounds probably. That's so much squatting. <laughs> it's like, I don't care. Like go, go unrack your body weight. Don't even squat it. Just unrack it and hold it for five hold minutes. It. Yeah. That sounds like a much like, more reasonable thing to do. And still probably like, it's I, just I, in terms sure. of like core and everything. It's so much. And then I, I can just imagine for some people, like you got to save a little bit for your jump, but like what your legs feel like lining up for a broad jump. And I'm sure there was a, a time that you had to do it in. You couldn't just sit there and recover, but like, oh, those challenges, a lot of the rogue challenges I've been super impressed with. I know Colton's cleaned up on a bunch of them. Carolyn Prevost, I think one for the women too. And she has as well, but, um, Taylor man, Williams, make, I'd be sore. Ooh. I'd be so sore after doing that. <laughs> I think, uh, Taylor Williams, I think made like oh, one year. It might've been after COVID or during COVID, but when they first introduced, I think she made like $30,000 just off of doing rogue challenges. Oh, good for her. I feel like Colton's building his home gym right now. And, and I know a lot of their stuff comes with like equipment prizes, like a barbell and a whatever. Mm -hmm. So I feel like he's oh, just yeah. outfitting his whole gym. He's just like, oh, another rogue challenge. No problem. And he lines them up. And <laughs> just like hits a home run and gets to gets to like, oh, two new barbells for the gym. Nice. Um, but it's awesome. I love like I, I would not, you know, I'd get smashed at that one. I know my limits and i think the guys who are crushing it are like they're squatters like like colton can squat forever he squats fast he's like squats heavy he could just squat for ages and i that's not my long legs would not appreciate that at test pc did one of the rogue challenges it was a thousand pound challenge and he actually won a shirt by eclipsing the number I got, yeah i got a thousand i'm part of a thousand pound club it was funny i wore that shirt <laughs> I wore that shirt. I forgot where was I. Oh, I was up at the HWPO like groundbreaking, and uh, Katie was there. Oh and yeah, we were doing a workout of uh, everyone that was there. And Katie said, "Nice shirt." I'm like, "Thanks." She goes, "You know, we just don't give those away." I'm like, "No, I work for it." <laughs> you know, so yeah, I'm kind of proud of that. 46 years old, I can still put up a little bit of weight. And it was so it was a total like a uh, like powerlifting total, or was it? It was a uh, back max back squat deadlift and bench press in an hour yeah in an hour yeah, yeah. how long did you take <laughs> i used the whole hour <laughs> did you really oh yeah. man i feel like i wouldn't i'd be getting cold like i wouldn't want to an hour it feels like ages well well it, shoot i mean you had to show all your weights i mean you've done the road. oh yeah no yeah, 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 yeah. that's, that's included true, in there mind. 
Yeah, that's included. The in admin. There. It's like 40 minutes of admin work and 20 minutes oh of. God. Yeah. So yeah. for those that do the Rogue Invitational, I mean, I've never done the Rogue, uh, the qualifier. I definitely can relate to it. It took me like two hours just to find the right scale, you know, and find the right, you know, just all that stuff. I mean, when you guys did the online road invitation, they sent you everything. So that yeah. kind of helpful. But, uh, but yeah, man, I, we had I to waste not... stuff for the online games in 2020. And yeah, so we had right. to, with our judge ahead of time, you didn't have to do it on camera, but you had to do it with the judge they sent ahead of time yeah. and you had to mark all the equipment um, yeah. so that they knew that those pieces were pre-weighed. They were like taped and, and, markered and signed but um yeah it's yeah the online competition system is getting it's getting serious it's, it, which is i mean it's, it's good in yeah. some ways it's getting harder to cheat but the the barrier is getting high to you got to spend a lot of time and be serious about it if you want to try to go to some of those premier events or you could just do well enough and, and get the invites or the pre-qualifiers yeah god that's i mean that's the easy way right <laughs> well <laughs> depends who you ask yeah. I don't know why everybody doesn't just do that. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, we well, don't want to we don't want to keep you on anymore. We, we we said about thirty minutes, but I I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you one question. We're well, not even a question, but um, I guess it's technically a question. But you know, you talk about people that have more than you know. You 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 work part time throughout most of the season. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I'm sure you probably are, but like. You know, Fikowski Brent is a good friend of yours. He he also works part time as well. But I didn't realize one of his new jobs he picked up was was this. You know, this. this Isn't that awesome? I know. Breaking down so, barriers. He is. It's it's like you know. Uh, did you have any? Did he warn you about this, or are you just as surprised as all of us? Or <laughs> no, sometimes it's funny. I don't. <clears throat> <laughs> my my younger brother actually put a great comment on his post. Sometimes I don't even have to get involved. People will just speak for me. Log out, like you can read the comments and be like, they'll be like, can't wait for at P Valner to see this and comment. I'm like, I don't even have to. It's good. It speaks for itself. I think it's sweet. Good for him. That's awesome. Yeah. My wife saw it and yeah. she's like, she's like, man, good for Brent. He's conventionally attractive. And I was a bit like, yeah. huh. I don't know what that means me, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, John Magazine's gonna be life. getting a call from Vellner. Hey, I need to show my wife that I'm a conventionally attractive. You guys got another yeah. photo shoot coming? Uh, I don't know. I've got a haircut planned for Thursday, so we'll wait. We'll wait and see. Um, but yeah, my brother made some comment on it that said, "I think he said if CrossFit doesn't work out for you, you could always just beach." And I don't know if anybody's seen the Barbie movie. Yeah, but Ken has a line during the movie where he says that his job isn't really lifeguard it's actually just beach <laughs> and so it was great he just made it it was an absolutely perfect poignant ken joke uh mm-hmm. and it, i just i didn't need to add anything to that it was it was well it was well executed but hey i think that's awesome good for him man getting getting while the getting's good if he's I, gonna might as well take advantage while you're spending all this time to sculpt the perfect body sure sure and who knows? Maybe there might be some stuff that comes out of this. Maybe you guys can bring back the uh, the the hazing challenges, and you know, whoever <laughs> loses the work, they have to do like a, a mail calendar shoot for the everyone else or something. Uh, but if Brent loses, he already has most of the pictures already. Yeah, that's right. No, I mean that's good for him. Like, like I said, if you while he's in like his perfect prime shape, you should get. Mm-hmm. I should get some photos like that. Again, oh, yeah. my wife's told me he's like, while while you're in really good shape, you should take some pictures for when you're like fifty and you're like. I used to be someone. I used to have this great body. <laughs> and then I can I can look back and reminisce fondly about what what was. But I think that's awesome. Maybe he's uh, who knows. Maybe all the CrossFit Games athletes' phones are going to start ringing now, and the modeling world is going to be set ablaze. Oh, but probably not. It makes sense. It I makes don't know, sense. man. I feel like uh, absolutely some, a lot of the guys could could pull that off. I don't know. There's some, there's like the Brents and Rich Fronings in the world. And then there's like the Pat Vellners and Matt Frazers that we like, we live over here. <laughs> yeah. I'm bringing this to Rogue because it's still 2023. Perfect. I will try to, I'll try to do right by it. Yeah. Cool. Well, you're our first yeah. guest. Anything Pat. else, guys? I, I didn't, can't believe I'm the first guest. I feel flattered. Uh, it's mostly been my fault. I just have, uh, Patrick's the one I have guests forever. And I was just waiting for the right one. And, oh, sweet of you. 
Yeah. We got Brent next week, so but we would definitely I mean we obviously we could sit here and talk all day, but we know how valuable your time is. Um, but you know, we'd definitely love to have you back on just to talk and just hang out and have fun. Oh, I appreciate it. You got did catch me at a good time. I don't have a whole lot else going on today. Um, one more session of rowing before I pick my son up from daycare, but uh I'm glad that it was nice to catch up with you guys and spend a little time. And I, I don't know, Pat, am I seeing you at Rogue as well or no? Just Brent, uh, yes, just I'll, be there. There. I'll be there as well. All right. Yep. Cool. Well, I'll try not to suck like always. <laughs> like I'm lost. All right. Thanks, Pat. We'll see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> see you guys. Take care. Mm-hmm. There we go. Had to kick him out. Yeah, I mean, I've never had of... guests on, so it's just. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think all of us were kind of like, oh. "Oh, what's next? What do we do? What do we do now?" Yeah. Uh, speaking of yeah. guests, it, that isn't the only one. Look at this guy. Oh shit! <laughs> well, it just gets better. I would have trimmed my beard. <laughs> what's up, boys? How are you? What's up, Justin? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. All right, good. Uh, I was, I was, uh, I don't have my accoutrement for uh podcast usually. So you'll have to, hopefully the, the internet here at Rhino will hold up. It's not the greatest. So we'll take the raw cutler any day. <laughs> How yeah. you doing boys? Brian's the one you need to be asking that. I know. He might still get lag from two months ago. The world traveler. Exactly. Speaking of yes. world traveling. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Aren't, aren't you about to set off around the world? Not around the world, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, we got we got road coming up, and then uh, and then we're off to Egypt for a while. So yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. And at, who so, uh, who do you guys have at road? You have at least three, maybe. We four? have four. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Bailey, Kyra, and um, uh, Alex. I've done my uh, predictions. Uh, p- I'm picking them all in the bottom five. Nice. That's probably it's just, that's about right. When it comes to Alex, I think you should just keep picking her like 18 at everything. Yeah. Just keep Dude. just keep just stay nice and steady. Keep picking her 18. We well, like well, that. Well, let me throw. I, I haven't actually done this on the women's side. I could, but I was we we just had Valner on, and I mentioned to him that 16 of the 20 men in the field have at least one top 10 finish at the CrossFit Games. That's a pretty robust field. It's a it's an incredibly robust field. Yes, super, without question. Um, yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, obviously, we're stoked. We got uh, you know great uh, great participation from our athletes, and uh, you know, I, I I mean, obviously, I wish a couple of our athletes were 100. percent Ricky and Alex are both. Ricky's coming back from injury, and obviously, he was good enough to win the Rogue um, qualifier. But he'd be the first to tell you his shoulder's not 100. percent you know, specifically, uh, going heavy overhead. Um, so we'll see, you know, I think it just depends on the programming and Alex has been battling a a wrist injury, um, since just actually just after the games, um, and she hasn't been able to snatch an overhead squat. So, um, she's a bit limited, but you know, the good thing about rogue is it's, it's an exhibition and it's fun. And, and I think ultimately, um, we'll go down there and, and we do the best we can do. And, and, you know, I think, understanding that, um, you know, people aren't hundred percent is very important, you know, so you set your expectations where you need to and, and you go from there. Um, but obviously it's exciting that Bailey there and Kyra and, uh, the camp is incredibly well represented. Uh, I don't know that anyone has more than four athletes. So I feel very proud about that. It's pretty cool. You know, not, not everyone has that approach of wanting to be so, uh, transparent about what's maybe limiting them coming into or during a competition. Yeah, but I think it's fair to talk about because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's what they're dealing with. And I think it's reality. Uh, And I think it, you know, people go into an event, you know, especially spectators and the community understanding like, hey, this is this is the reality of the situation. Um, And I think something like Rogue is a scenario where, like, it's a prestigious event. Um, but it's also just a cool event to be a part of. So you go down there and I think we'll be very smart as to like making sure that we don't 
make things worse. And they understand that the, this is a much bigger picture for the season. So somebody like Alex, you know, we'll see, you know, like, I mean, it's very possible there might be an event or two where she's got to pull a BKG and, you know, um, like what he did at the games. And if that's the deal, that's the deal. And, you know, we go down there and do the best we can in the events that we can. And, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem saying that because that's the reality of the situation. And I don't think we need to mask it. It's not an excuse. It's just what it is. It's just where we're at. Um, you know, and the, and the big thing for us is obviously for, for somebody like Alex is coming off the games, coming in fifth is making sure that after rogue, we can have that really big chunk of training time to make a push for the podium this next season at the CrossFit games. I mean, that's the, that's the, the number one priority. And at what point do you make, you know, like make the decision that like, Oh yeah, she's a little banged up, but this is rogue. It's a, it's a great opportunity. You want to seize it versus is this really the best decision towards pursuing that bigger ultimate goal? I think if it was a more serious injury um, that we would probably, uh, you know, have second thoughts about doing it. Um, she's limited in about 10 to 15% of movements. So it's very programming based right now. Um, you know, there it, it's a possibility that the programming could come up and uh, she might be able to do everything pain-free. Um, but if that's not the reality of the situation, then we'll deal with it when it comes. So I think it's just ultimately like one, can she do the majority of the events? Two, uh, is this going to jeopardize her for the upcoming season? And with what she has, you know, unless the, I mean, the doctor basically told her, unless you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> we're, you're, you're not going to make it worse. So, so ultimately right now, it's just a matter of being smart and working around it. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think, we're just being we're just being really intelligent about the decisions that we make but i think rogue is a scenario she's never got to experience rogue she earned it this year and i i think it's one of those events that you know unless you just simply can't compete uh it's a tough one to pass up it's just a it's just a a, a super exciting competition to be a part of yeah and i mean there's i i, I was just starting to do some preliminary research now that I'm back. And like, I think this is Brent Fikowski's first time at Rogue. It's, you know, it's, it can be difficult to make it there. So absolutely yeah, when think, you get the chance. Yeah. I, I know he wasn't there last year. Um, I don't know. Did he, I, I mean, I, you would know better than me. I don't know if he did the online version a couple of years ago, but um, okay. yeah, no, it's great. I mean, the field is, is awesome. It's, it's a super exciting field. I mean, <clears throat> um, you know, it's uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting to to be a part of, be exciting to coach there, be exciting to watch. Um, but what I love about it is really and truly, uh, you know, obviously you want your athletes to do the best they can do, but but you know you go down there and and uh, you know the program is gonna be a little different. You know, there's gonna be some implements and some apparatus that you know you haven't seen before, and um, so it'll be fun to kind of see how people adapt on the spot uh, and um, and. And, you know, we go with that. I mean, I think we've seen historically, um, you know, it's not necessarily the people that do really well at, at Rogue, well, obviously, you know, except the winners. But, you know, the people that do well at Rogue don't necessarily go to the games and and, and just smash it. I mean, um, so it's a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I, I think it'll be fun to watch and, and fun to see. I know Ricky is chomping at the bit to get back out there and, you know, again, I think there he has some limitations, and we'll see what the programming is. I think fitness-wise, he's a fucking tank right now, and you know, if, so if it's really based on that, he's gonna be tough to beat. But if there's some things there that just, you know, uh, shoulder-wise or challenge that, you know, that that'll it's just where he is in his return and his recovery. The beautiful thing is he he doesn't really have he has no pain, which is phenomenal. It's just a matter of of strength and, you know, building back the strength, uh, specifically with, um, you know, uh, high level weightlifting right now. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing limitation wise. And then you're hitting the, the jet setting bound out to the middle East after that, aren't you? Yeah. So we're, we're programming for Elfit. Uh, it's first time working with Elfit. Uh, it's super exciting. 
you know, we're doing kind of soup to nuts programming uh, for them. And um, I'm very, you know, I'm excited. I've never been to Egypt. So obviously, you know, it's, it's a spot that uh, it's kind of a bucket list place as far as um, sightseeing and whatnot. Uh, so that'll be exciting, but uh, we're going to be working, you know, we're, we're working hand in hand with them. Uh, we'll, we'll be handling a lot of the um, behind the scenes stuff as far as the programming and working closely with the judging. Uh, we'll be helping out with, uh, you know, coaching some uh, spectator classes. And afterwards, the following weekend, we're doing a camp down on the Red Sea, uh, which will be really, really cool. Um, just kind of like a fitness retreat, uh, several days there. And I think it'll be. Are you are you leading the Sunset Beach yoga class? Uh, I am not leading that. <laughs> if anyone has seen my, mo my mobility, that would be kind of a joke. Um, but, uh, no, we're, we're excited about it. it, it it's, um, it's obviously an, a prestigious event to be a part of. Uh, we're very honored and, uh, you know, it's probably the, the, the biggest event that we have programmed for, um, you know, exclusively, obviously last year. Uh, we programmed, we were part of the programming collective for Wadapalooza, and that was obviously awesome. Uh, but that was just for the qualifier. And then uh, Kiefer had a big role in programming Zalos games, which is great. But this is as far as like a, a, a fitness festival, you know, I mean, Elfit is very comparable to Wadapalooza uh, in the Middle East as far as the divisions and as far as the number of competitors. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's obviously just just super exciting for us as a as a brand and as a camp to be a part of it. Will any underdogs athletes be competing out there? I don't think so. Uh, we, you know, I, I feel like it's a little bit dicey in those situations when you program uh, for a competition. Um, no, none of our big name athletes will be there. Uh, possibly some some athletes that follow the the template, but. Uh, you know, it can always be scrutinized when you're at camp and you program for a big competition like that. And then you have maybe some of your athletes competing and not that we would ever give them inside information. It's just, I think it's, it's, it's easy to be scrutinized in that situation. So it was a scenario where they understood we, we weren't really going to, um, to push it to, to our, um, you know, games and semi-level athletes. Um, but, uh, but obviously we're, you know, incredibly excited for everyone that is competing. And I, you know, I think it's a huge event uh, for, for, you know, Africa and, uh, and obviously for that region of the world. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's exciting for us to, to, to be a part of it. I've, you know, as you know, I've been to, well, during this trip, I went to six different competitions and I got to see a variety of different uh, event programmers or organizers. Sometimes the organizers program their own competition. Sometimes they outsource it. And I got the chance to speak to most of the programmers, whether they were intimate with the event or brought in from the outside. And um, mostly I'm just trying to learn and, and soak in a variety of information. But, you know, Madrid is a, is a good example as well, because there's nearly 3000 total athletes competing there. There's dozens and dozens of different divisions. Elliot Simmons and QHP programmed that uh, competition. Yep. And I was, uh, you know, I had a chance to talk to him when you are taking the, the the reins as underdogs is this year, and it's got so many different divisions, what can you help like contextualize what the process of like, of not just programming one workout, but then making sure that it's checking the box that you want it to check for every division that needs to go through that test over the course of a day. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot that goes into it. Obviously, like when you build out the programming for a competition, you kind of want to, you're, you're telling a story. Um, and for us, it started with the qualifier. Um, so essentially you're making sure you're testing things, uh, you know, that you're going to build upon, um, for the competition. So it has to make sense. I think there needs to be a progression. So when we started with that, it was one, you know, kind of talking with the, uh, event coordinators about, okay, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? Who are we trying to speak to? Um, we want to be inclusive, but at the same time, you know, we want these these workouts to be, um, you know, competitive. We want them to be challenging. We want it to be interesting. Uh, and, but we want to make sure that we're testing for the athletes that we want to make it to the to the final or to the actual in person competition. Uh, and then from there, uh, we built out the 
individual um, workouts, the elite individual, and then it kind of funnels down from there. And again, it, it comes back to, okay, you tell the story from, the, from, you know, leading into the qualifier to then the in-person competition. Uh, we're lucky in a sense that Elfit has an incredible venue where you can do a lot of cool things that, you know, a lot of other competitions can't do with, they have indoor and outdoor, um, you know, uh, venues at, at the actual, like the big venue. Um, so you've got, you know, things that you can do inside, outside, et cetera. Uh, there's bodies of water you can use. There's different things. So when we look at it, we want to make sure that it's a great test of fitness, but it's also very spectator friendly um, and that it's something that's going to challenge the athletes. But then it's also something that can um, be scaled, right? It can be scaled, um, you know, utilizing a lot of the same equipment for teams and then um, obviously for you know masters and for teens and for scale divisions etc so there's a lot that goes into it uh, but you know I, I think we're lucky in the sense that the the event coordinators the guys that are that are running outfit have done it for a long time uh, so they're very experienced when it comes to that uh, so there were certain things that like Kiefer and I wanted to do and they were just like uh, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you know, and then, and then, you know, there might be like, you also think about it in terms of like, okay, yes, we have obviously access to a lot of equipment, but it's not the CrossFit games. So there are some limitations when it comes to that. Right. And I, you, so, so sometimes you have to say like, oh, well, my vision is this. And then they're like, okay, well, we can't, you know, we can't really afford for everyone to have that or everyone to do this or for us to have a hundred sandbags on the floor at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's like different things that go into it. But I think at the end, ultimately, you know, it's, it's, do you, are you telling a story that has a progression? Uh, are you making it inclusive, but are, are, are you also making it, you know, challenging and a great test of fitness and spectator friendly because an in-person competition in my opinion that isn't spectator friendly you haven't done um justice to the programming so that was a that was something that was very important to us and just i know patrick has a very uh, exciting thing he wants to ask you about but when what how long is that process like when does outfit reach out to you when do you start programming relative to when the competition is because i think sometimes people don't understand how long oh this has be. been this has been months months in the making <laughs> Uh, we, they, they contacted us, uh, geez. I mean, we've known about this probably for six months. Um, you know, and then there are a lot of phone calls, just kind of working out details, uh, figuring out exactly like what they wanted us to do, what they wanted us to be a part of. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, the qualifier doing a lot of the content, uh, as far as promotion and stuff is concerned, we did a lot of that here in house, and then, you know, they they do some stuff over there, uh, you know. So so yeah, it's been a it's been several months in the making. It's a very big undertaking, uh, but it's it's obviously something that um, you know I, I think is has been has been great and 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 it's very exciting for us. And I hope it's something, you know, uh, you know. Hope, hopefully, this will be a partnership that that we do for a while, and then I'm I'm hoping that this will open up some doors for us with with other competitions and and give us opportunities because. Um, yeah, I think it's something that we love to do and it's something that we're excited to be a part of. I was hoping you would say that. Patrick. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, Justin's got to go pick up Jax here in probably like 10 minutes. But um, um, Dave made an uh, – he does his week in review. I know you're, you're a big fan of those. But uh, one, of, one of the things he, uh, he, um, he clipped and put on was um, he talked about doing like an invitational type style but using camps. And then he mentioned HWPO, Proven, um, um, Mayhem. And he also said that he didn't think that they would go for it. Well, it's kind of been – it's actually been pretty exciting news because if you watch, if you look at some of the uh, comments on his post, you know, I mean, I don't know who runs. It's not. It's obviously probably not Fraser or, you know, Tia or anyone that runs their social media, but they all seem like they're game for it. And then um, I actually made a post. I'm like, hey, what about underdogs? And, you know um, – and I thought about it. It's like, you know, obviously there's a lot of logistics involved, but there's probably no better person that I can think of that knows that knows this type of style, and how it could work because based on your background and grid and, you know, 
there's a lot of things they can learn from grid but i mean what are your thoughts on this and i mean i mean is this uh is this something that you're you, you would support in the off season yeah i mean i i think listen this is this is an idea that actually was brought to me a couple of years ago by filthy 150 that we're thinking about running this type of event and and uh, it got kind of kibosh because of COVID. Um, but they were thinking about the idea of putting together a competition that had camps. And uh, if, if, you know, I've been very outspoken about the idea of something like drive to survive uh, formula one with, with um, obviously, which is a reality TV show, but formula one, the, the whole format is based off of teams, right? The teams mm-hmm. of, of Red Bull and Mercedes, and Haas and McLaren, et cetera. Well, I think you've got these built-in teams already in CrossFit, and I think they're the camps. Uh, now, obviously, there are certain athletes that aren't, quote-unquote, part of camps that you would want to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, um, when you look at, you know, somebody like Jeff Abbey, right? Uh, you look at somebody like um, Brent Fikowski. Uh, you, you know, there are athletes who are obviously – some of the best in the world where we have to figure that out. But I think it lends itself very well to CrossFit. Uh, you know, I mean, I love Dave, Dave's post, the idea. I'm not sure Dave realizes there are other camps behind besides proven mayhem and um, eight hard work pays off, but I'm here to tell you that there are. Mm-hmm. I also wasn't able to see the post by Dave because I'm blocked by Dave, but you know, maybe oh. at some point in time he won't, he'll take me off being blocked. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and then I went on on the underdogs page and, and said, hey, you know, we'd love to crash that party and be a part of it. Um, but I think this is obviously not like this is this is not a new idea, um, you know, and I think it's a scenario that would be incredibly exciting for the community. I think it's an idea that would make a ton of sense. There are a ton of logistics, Patrick, but I I think this is – if I'm being honest, I think this is the way of team competition in the future, uh, especially at, at a high level. Uh, I think if we want to make the team competition incredibly exciting, if we want the best athletes in the world to be a part of it, uh, this would be a way to make that a reality uh, on probably a separate weekend um, than the CrossFit Games, or perhaps this is a part of the season where we can see team and individual and individual events that are a, a whole part of a, you know, fitness tour, a CrossFit tour, whatever that ultimately becomes. But I think that these are the things that need to be on the table uh, when we ultimately talk about professionalizing the sport and making this a sport that eventually can can tell stories and create excitement for spectators who are currently CrossFit fans but also those right now who aren't CrossFit fans. I think, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity for us to capitalize on that. And um, listen, there, there, there are a lot of people who are a hell of a lot smarter than me who can probably come up with the logistics better. I mean, I'd love to be in the room for, for those conversations. Um, But I, but I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I think it's something that that really needs to be explored because uh, I, I think right now we're missing the boat. I agree. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll let you go here, but I'm sure me and Brian will do some discussions, but I really think from, especially with the ESPN deal and ESPN and knowing the deal and knowing ESPN that they really want to, um, increase their, the, the product that they have on the stream ESPN plus a streaming service. This is a great opportunity because I look at the UFC deal that they have with ESPN and there's no reason why they shouldn't be doing that with CrossFit in terms of creating unique, content just for their stream because guess what people will subscribe to espn plus not only to watch the games but also to watch of the invite that has camps or a reality show or something like that i mean it may sound you know it may it may not sound like true crossfit but i think it's what the sport needs to be to professionalize and when that happens then crossfit as a methodology will grow with it as well but um, i also think like think of the storylines that could be created um you know if you get media into the camps and you know listen i i know people are worried about it becoming a shit show but i mean let's be honest right now uh, you know uh crossfit is really one of the only sports 
where it's just incredibly vanilla. <laughs> There's not a lot of drama. There's not a lot of, of, of stories. And at the end of the day, it sucks people in. And that's fucking reality. Like that's the, that's real life. You know, I mean, we've had it in our camp. People know very well a lot of the things that have happened, you know, in our camp over the last two years as far as some of the volatility with some of the athletes leaving, et cetera. But I think, you know, I think the public would be really interested in a lot of those stories. And, you know, we've chosen to kind of, you know, take the high road in some of those situations. But at the same time, you know, I, I think that, that people like to understand and see behind the scenes on a lot of things. Uh, and it's not always puppy dogs and ice cream. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of meat, you know, really great stories, but also, you know, really sad stories or, 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 you know, dramatic stories that ultimately I, I think would, would grow the sport and would give, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 the opportunity to be able to reach an entirely new audience. Because let's be honest, we're, we're in an age right now, we're in a YouTube age, we're in a social media age. And as much as, you know, like, I, I would say, you know, I don't love a lot of that situation. Um, it's where we are. It's the reality of most sports. It's the reality of, you know, um, MMA. It's the reality of, of the majority of professional sports. Um, and, and the fact that the fact that CrossFit is not a part of that and, and doesn't have a seat at the table when it comes to those things, uh, is, you know, we're really missing out and, and that's why we're a niche sport and that's why we'll continue to be a niche sport, uh, until, you know, we break down some of those barriers. Hey, Justin, you got any of these? I can't see what it is. My, my. I don't have my glasses on. What are they? Oh, the, uh, the cards. The cards? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have. Well, we have Alex Kazan. <clears throat> That's who this is. I got five of them here. There we go. Yeah. I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of bringing a couple to Rogue, and maybe yeah. we'll see if anyone happens to be listening, and if they find both of us at the same time, we might have a couple to give to them. Ooh. I think if I think as long as you pick her 18th, she'll definitely sign it for you. I think that's all you gotta do. <laughs> hey Justin, thanks for joining us. I know you gotta go pick up Jax. Tell uh Jax and the whole fam I said hi and hopefully we'll be seeing you. Well, I mean, we'll see you down in um in Austin here in a in a few weeks. But uh thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Uh we'll definitely need to get you on again and um yeah, have fun, buddy. Anytime. Hey, love you guys. Talk to you soon. See you, Justin. Right. I figured it out. Look at that. <laughs> I was ready this time. Yep. Um, no, I, th I think Justin brings up a lot of good points. You know, obviously, Brian, you know, I'm huge in the UFC. How I actually got into UFC in terms of watching it was the, the Ultimate Fighter, which, I don't, Brian, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ultimate Fighter. It's the reality show. And they filmed that, and it, it saved it saved UFC. And, I mean, you know, it made them superstars. And the, the Ultimate Fighter was basically a reality show where they got some a bunch of up-and-coming, you know, fighters. They put them in a the house, and then they had them compete, you know, weekly against each other in teams. And it just, like, it that just makes so much sense to me why you're not doing that for CrossFit, whether it be a team or at least gathering a bunch of, like, semifinal athletes who are looking for a way to the games or something, or even quarterfinal athletes. And you gather them all in the house, they do competitions and the winner gets a free inv uh, invite to the semifinals, you know, or something like that, where, you know, it's, it's low hanging fruit, I think. And, and the UFC actually did something similar to what this, what Dave was suggesting was um, one year they brought in, there's two main camps in UFC. There was a thing called the, the black Azillions, which were a combination of, they were based out Florida, and I believe the other one was uh, America Top Team. And they got their prospects, and they those two camps went head-to-head -head through a whole season of it. And it was one of the more popular seasons. And uh, I just – I think it's really cool. Like I said, when I heard that and then I started seeing all the responses, I got excited because it's been a while since I've been excited. But just seeing something like that and the possibility of something like that, I really do. I really hope that something like that happens. It might, it's, it probably won't happen this year. It definitely won't happen this year, but it's definitely to keep an eye out for the upcoming year. 
Yeah, I mean, and what Justin said is important is that it's not a it's not a new idea. This idea, and even this idea of the ultimate fighter, is something that I've heard a half a dozen people mention in the last three months alone. And that, and some of these ideas have been existing for years, mm -hmm. but but at some point, someone needs to take the reins, and someone needs yeah. to take an you know take an initiative, get an investor, get some money behind it, and say let's just do it. And you know, it's yeah. you just sometimes yeah, just do it, and then things will happen. I think they're on. the 30 something seasons of ultimate fighter now or something crazy like that. So, and it had to start sometimes. I think it's about time that something like that happens because people have been talking for a while, but in, eventually there's got to be some action. Yeah. I mean, every year, one of the main draws for the UFC, uh, the UFC ultimate fighters is they bring in athletes. Like this past year was uh, Michael Chandler and, uh, um, 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 geez, I'm drawing a blank, but it was Michael Chandler. And, I can't help uh, you with that one. I know, I know you can't. Jeez, uh, but uh, um, but it was Michael Chandler and jeez, um, anyway. his opponent. Yeah, his opponent. No, well, it was uh, yeah. But anyways, it's killing me right now because I'm just like I'm on a, I'm excited about it. It was O'Connor McGregor, duh. But those were the two head coaches. Can you imagine a scenario when you bring in like, like I said, a dream scenario where Rich Froning's one coach and Matt Frazier's the other coach, and then you bring in all these quarterfinal athletes and they pick from them. And then they, these athletes get to train from Mayhem slash, you know, HWPO from the from the, the the figureheads of these two camps, and you know, I just think it's a great opportunity. And the thing, the reason why reality shows are so popular, not just with us, but with production companies, because it's a low amount of dollars to produce these reality shows. Because there's not as much production, you don't have to make these elaborate sets. Uh, that's why you see so many people do reality shows. Or, or, or all these shows because it's actually pretty cheap to do. Um, you know, you see all these like, you know, survivors or the bachelors or anything like that. Most of it's, most of their money is spent on what paying for the crew and also paying for the location, but everything else is usually paid by donations and stuff like that, or, you know, trade out or through sponsors and stuff like that. But I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, like you said, it's something that's been put around for a while, but this might be the start of something. I mean, Dave has shown some interest. He put it out there. He got. He's getting responses. He's getting responses by people that he doesn't didn't think would be um, interested in it. And it obviously it looks like they are interested. And I know someone like Justin who, you know, who has a training camp, a training camp that's often overlooked a, a, a lot amongst other, like training think that There's so many other training camps out there that have just great athletes. They want to throw their throw their hat in the ring because for. If proven doesn't want to do it or another camp doesn't want to do it, I'm sure there's a camp that's that wants to be involved somewhere somehow. If anything, it helps to get their name out there, their training out their their training methodology out there as well. Yeah, just came from Norway. There's like two dozen semifinal level athletes at, at least training every day together in the mornings there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I spend most of the day, uh, half of the afternoon because when I've made those posts on our so our stories, a lot of people were responding. And unfortunately, I'm sorry for a lot of those, a lot of those uh, responses were going in our inbox where I couldn't see it. I actually had to pick on it, but I was having great conversations with some people about it. And, you know, they brought up suggestions and I would ask, ask them, well, let's just say if it was a team of four, who is their fourth athlete? Who is the second girl? You know, stuff like that. The second woman that'd be part of that team, you know, but um, I know I think it's, you know, I'm excited about it. I think, I mean, you know, I don't know. I think this is, it's probably just one of those crazy you know, maybe it's a wish that I have for the sport, but you know, I, I just think it's kind of cool. But I don't know. we've seen it happen before. I don't know. But I don't know. Um, well, thanks for. I know it's been a busy day for you. And I'm, I don't, hopefully, your uh, night is not as busy. <laughs> you know, I just you know been on the road for almost fifty days, so a lot of things like uh, just like day to day things that needed to take care of today. Even simple stuff like. Grocery shopping. <laughs> Scott Plancy. Come, yeah. Scott's coming down here this week. We're going to the disc golf championships, U.S. disc golf championships. I'm pumped yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, what What was in your fridge? When you opened it, what is in your fridge? Oh, you got it. Uh, not much. Not, not, <laughs> not really. I mean, I, I knew I was going to be gone for a long time, so I got I yeah. like intentionally got rid of pretty much anything, but – <clears throat> you know, I had yep. some rice and some, uh, I had some meat in the freezer and some rice in the fridge. I was able to get through like last night and this morning and then went to the store. Yeah. Well, I'm excited that you're going to the, uh, you know, this weekend you get to kind of enjoy your other passion. So that's kind of cool. And, you know, um, 
yeah, I'm glad that that that's happening for you. But I think there's really not much else going on. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm I'm also I thought that was cool that we had Brett, um, that we had Pat on, and you know, we're working on maybe getting Brent for next week. And um, I don't know if you, anyone listening, if you guys have any suggestions of who you thought would love to have have on the show, DM us. Let us know. We'll try. We'll see what we can do to try to bring them on. Um, you know, obviously there's plenty of options out there to listen to athletes, but uh, I don't know. We're trying to do hopefully something different, but I don't know. It was fun. It was fun. I'm glad we finally did that. And yeah, we'll, we'll get some more guests for sure. Yeah. But all right, Brian, I'll let you go. Everyone that uh, has joined us for, I mean, I think we had close to 70, 80 people tuning in live and uh, we really appreciate it as always. Uh, if you want to support us, we have our Patreon, um, our new merchandise, our fall line is out, please. That's another way you can support us out there. Some pretty cool colors. Um, you know, just a bunch of other things up on the horizon. We're getting right into the biz. Brian's back for a while. I know we got a bunch of pre crash stuff that's pop, uh, happening. So um, yeah. And then of course we got rogue. So Again, thanks for all the support, um, and as always, be friendly, our friend.